Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Suzanne Wenzel, the Richard and Ann Thor Professor in Urban Social Development and Chair of the Department of Adults and Healthy Aging in the USC Suzanne Doric Peck School of Social Work. Welcome to this event. Welcome to Wild Ideas and Innovations, a radical conversation about homelessness. It's really rare to see wild, innovation, and radical in one title. Um, and here we are, here we are today, about to apply all three items to homelessness, to ending, to addressing homelessness. So I thought it would be valuable to start with a few definitions. Um, Regarding wild, what is a wild idea? I, I Googled for a little bit of assistance to make sure I got the definitions and the synonyms uh, that I wanted. A wild idea is an idea that's not tethered to conventions or existing ways of doing things. A wild idea signifies freedom in thought. What about innovations? Innovations we see much more commonly, but innovations are new ideas. They're new processes. Uh, and innovation represents change, transformation, upheaval. Uh, the synonym revolution even came up when I Googled it. And a radical conversation. What, what is a radical conversation? This means that we want to allow ourselves to deviate from usual paths. We want to discuss different approaches, points of view, draw on unique and outstanding expertise as represented in our speakers today, and that will be thorough and wide ranging in our conversation. So today, we don't, we don't want to break anything that works. We, we don't want to be that revolutionary. We don't want to promote that kind of upheaval. So we don't want to break anything that works, but we do want to facilitate a bigger breakthrough. And that is in partnership with the city and the county to advance collective efforts to address and end homelessness in Los Angeles. And addressing homelessness must be a priority, and it must be a priority for every one of us in the county and the city. Los Angeles is second only to New York in the numbers of persons experiencing homelessness. And in fact, I think since 1984, we've been vying with New York City for the title, uh, who has the most homeless people in the nation? And then that's quite an unfor unfortunate thought and reality. But it's interesting also to note that homelessness in the United States overall has declined in the past several years. This is based on reports from the National Alliance to End Homelessness. But in Los Angeles City and County, you probably know well that according to the 2016 homeless count, homelessness increased since 2015. And this, is, this increase is primarily due to the larger numbers of chronically homeless and unsheltered individuals. Indeed, the ones that we see are most likely to see every day as we make our way to work and home again. But the good news, there is good news in all of this. Today is good news. The good news is that as someone who has lived in Los Angeles for more than 25 years and who's been actively working as a researcher for all that time on this very issue and working directly with women, men, and youth who are affected by all the negative consequences of homelessness, I can tell you that there's no time like now, that now is different. It's different. There's never been an opportunity like this one with the passage of Measure HHH to build more housing, the passage of Measure H to support services, to provide supportive services to homeless persons entering permanent supportive housing. And there's never been such a well-articulated set of plans produced by the city and the county. And indeed, those plans are being implemented now. Well, implementation started long before those measures were passed. And so those are very strong positives to share. And there's also a level of commitment and collaboration across leaders in the city and county that I've not witnessed in my 25 years in Los Angeles. But even all that, even that, while it will make an enormous difference, won't be enough by itself to end homelessness in the city and the county. 
That's why we're here today, to push the envelope even more and to think boldly with our outstanding guest speakers, Chris Coe, Dion Joseph, Gabe Kaplan, and Ellen Sloan. So now I want to make an introduction. It's my privilege to introduce Marilyn Flynn. She is Dean and 2U Chair of Educational Innovation and Social Work in the USC Suzanne Dorick Peck School of Social Work. Dean Flynn is also the chair of the University Steering Committee on the USC Initiative for Ending Homelessness in Los Angeles. She's co-chair of the National Steering Committee, Grand Challenges Executive Committee of the American Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare. And I could go on and on, but in the interest of time, I won't. Please welcome Dean Marilyn Flynn. You know, something that will get you out of bed in the morning is the promise of a wild meeting. <laughs> so uh, I was inspired to come here. Just the title that you gave this, Suzanne, was uh, very inspiring. I want to thank the Department of Adults and Healthy Aging for uh, their inspiration in creating this meeting. I love the theme. It's exactly what we should be doing here. And I'm told it's going to be an exciting day and a great conversation, so good. Um, I learned last year that if we wanted to, we could print, using a 3D printer, the Viterbi School of Engineering could make a house in five hours. Now, this is really interesting to think about. Uh, when we say one of the biggest challenges that we have in homelessness is the lack of affordable housing. Certainly, a 3D printed house should be affordable and it should be doable. And so it's interesting to ask, why don't we have them? And once you start to ask, why aren't we just making, why don't we turn Viterbi into a little uh, production line and just pump out little houses all day? Well, all of you in this room, if you look at your own experience and you look at the jobs that you're trying to do, you know why that's not a sufficient solution. Uh, there are policy reasons that we don't do this, the nature of the people who are unhoused, uh, the question of where these places go and NIMBYism um, and other issues are part of the reason that this is something our provost calls a wicked problem. Uh, I think you know many of you what a wicked problem is, even if you don't call it a wicked problem. A wicked problem is something which, if you make one part of it better, something else gets worse. In other words, it's one of those program problems where you feel you can't win. But in our case, the University of Southern California and the Department of Adults and Healthy Aging and other groups are determined to successfully address this wicked problem and to make some progress. So uh, Suzanne has asked me just to give you a very brief overview of what we are attempting to do um, at the university co-designing solutions with those of you from the community. And we need the community perspectives, the community solutions are as important as any 3D houses or any other ideas that we may have here. And that's why I'm so glad to see such a great mix of people this morning. So we all know this is, this is the moment to be doing this. There could be no greater moment. We have at least 21 service initiatives from the county. We have new policy initiatives from the city, from the county, and um, at other levels, some in the state. 
we have a housing development initiative that is the real, realtors, real estate firms, um, and the private sector are energized and interested in, in options and alternatives. Uh, we have something we hardly ever have, and that's cooperation between the city and the county. That really means something can get done. We actually have resources. We have money. And we've done some careful planning. I shouldn't say we at the university. I mean we as members of the county, of the uh, city government. So we really have the best playing field we've ever had for introduction of wild ideas, of innovations, of things that will honestly make life better for every human being in Los Angeles County. Well, what, where is the university's role in all of this, and how did, we, how did we get involved? Well, I should say, to begin with, the profession of social work, the American Academy of Social Work in, in Washington, has approved, developed 12 grand challenges for the social work profession over the next decade. And these grand challenges are wicked problems where we hope to use some combination of science, new policy development, collaboration with communities in designing solutions. These 12 grand challenges include homelessness. And uh, this means, I think, our profession is looking to work with public health and other disciplines across the nation in interesting and harnessing the energies of universities, of practitioners, and others. So we have that grand framing, and since I'm deeply implicated in it, naturally our school is never going to escape this for the next decade. Um, However, for the university itself, President Max Nikias, two years ago, decided that this university should take on the, the challenge of reducing homelessness. He invited me to his office, and I, ca I can't imitate a Greek accent. It, all, it sounds sort of a cross between German and Italian, and it's not right at all. Um, but he said, Marilyn, he said, I want you to be our quarterback. And I don't know anything about football, really, except a few things. One is that the quarterback doesn't get knocked down as much as other people do. So I said, OK. I said, I will do this. Uh, so I'm not sure what a quarterback does with a wicked problem, but the first thing I did was to bring together a steering committee of deans across the campus because at this university, the deans controlled most of the resources and most of the possibilities for allocation and cooperation um, with others. This steering committee uh, is being led by Brenda Wewill, uh, to, is staffed by uh, Brenda Wewill, who you'll hear from today, and who is acting as the executive director for the whole university's initiative. She's done a fabulous job, and we have a number of things underway that I'm going to briefly mention to you that are harnessing all of the talent across the university, not just the talent in social work. Well, in the school itself, so we have the grand challenges from the American Academy of Social Work, we have the university's initiative. For the school itself, we have Professor Suzanne Wenzel and Professor Ben Henwood and other nationally known leaders in research on homelessness, which gives us a key position a key position to use what is available in this university and uh, use the departments which, of which they are a part to advance our initiative on ending homelessness. So we have particular strength all across the line in terms of what the potential is here. The question is, how do we get a hold of it, and how can we use the strengths that we have in the best way?
Well, I'd like to give you a few examples of what we have initiated over the last year, um, and this is only the beginning. We have been working very closely uh, with the city of Los Angeles itself, and our, our idea here is to spend some time on Skid Row, but actually to focus more on the so-called sending communities. We know that there's homelessness everywhere in Los Angeles now. And so we want to uh, begin, initiate activities in communities such as um, uh, Spa 6, of which we're a part, where there are homeless encampments and where we can try to prevent homelessness and reduce the numbers of people coming to Skid Row. Uh, so that's one, one initiative. Um, and we will be working with the city on this. Uh, the first thing that's likely to happen is maybe as many as 500 students in the fall will now be uh, volunteering at homeless navigation hubs and with nonprofit agencies and with local schools um, as part of outreach teams for, for this group. Um, with Brenda's uh, leadership, We've also finished an e-learning curriculum for city workers who have the most exposure to homeless population. Uh, you know, we never think of people who pick up garbage, the sanitation workers, as people that have to be trained to work with homeless. But the fact is that they visit these, these encampments over and over and over, and they become very impatient and very burned out, and it's very difficult for them to do their job. So we're trying to think very broadly about who's at the front line and provide people with a little bit better insight and a little bit better capacity to, to interact with, with this population and, and the challenges that they, um, that they uh, produce. Uh, we're going to start working with LAPD in June. We have a new curriculum, which will include, over the course of the next year, a leadership program uh, that increases the number of tools that um, uh, peace officers can use on the street with this population. I know there has already been training, of course, that people have received in this area, but uh, we hope to add to that, and we're co-designing that with the police department. Um, and finally, just these are just examples. We're collaborating uh, with a real estate development firm, Tishman International, the City Housing Commission, and a local nonprofit organization, U.S. Vets, uh, to construct new affordable housing for veterans that will be on the edge of this campus. You can see these are very, uh, very diverse efforts. They, they kind of reflect a, uh, a multi-pronged approach that I hope will continue to be characteristic of us. But almost every one of these initiatives has the community as a central part, and uh, community members are co-designing with us. The county is interested in what it calls the pipeline. That is, the county says, we are going to have a lot of new services and we have nobody to work in them. So the, the workforce has to be expanded, not simply by producing new social workers or new police or other, uh, other professionals, but people who actually have an interest, knowledge, and experience in working effectively with this population. So we're hoping to add, um, add to that. We're also uh, creating advanced training, not just in social work, but in architecture, in political science, sociology, dentistry, and medicine. We're trying to spread this across um, the university to increase the capacity of all the disciplines to work more with this population. I'm not going to talk to you much about research, innovation, and evaluation because you're going to be talking about this today. This is your main topic. Uh, but we did 
lead the homeless count, the point in time homeless count this year, for the first time, we're analyzing the data in greater depth than has ever been done before, and we're going to understand better who's out there and therefore how to intervene more effectively with the resources that we have. And then finally, we're going to figure out how many homeless and hungry students we have, and we have them. We find them in the library. We find them in cars, their own cars, sleeping in their cars. And uh, it's a challenge. It's a challenge in all the universities. There's 86,000 homeless and hungry students in the Cal State system. And we don't know how many there are here at USC. So we will also be taking care of our own, I hope. Well, it's wonderful to see you, and I appreciate the opportunity to give you a very quick overview. I hope you caught more of the spirit. Um, we have a lot of other activities going on, as always, but I think you can see the main focus is breadth. The main focus is working with community partners, and the main focus is uh, really innovation and work with groups in new ways that we haven't attempted before. Thank you. Well, I want to send a thank you, a big thank you, and make an introduction. So the thank you first, I want to acknowledge and thank from the bottom of my heart, Vice Chair Pam Francois, whose vision it was. She had the germ of the idea for a forum such as this with those crazy words of wild innovation and, and radical. So I thank you very much, Pam, for all you've done to make this come together. I also want to acknowledge a staff person who's helped us with every detail, and without her this could not have happened, and that is Adrian Lennox Little. And I also want to introduce our university trustee, Suzanne Dorick Peck, who has done so very much for our school and has, is doing so very much for our university. So thank you very much for being here. And I also want to introduce Brenda Wewell. She is director of the University Initiative for Ending Homelessness. Brenda. What are my notes? What happened to my notes? I have them right here, my notes. <laughs> One minute. Uh, good morning, everyone, and um, welcome to USC. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity, and I'm just wondering, so is everyone ready to get wild? Yeah. Good. Are you sure you believed us when we said we titled this Wild Ideas? We weren't kidding. So I'm glad you're here to join us. Uh, there's a lot of us in this room who are really passionate. We want to ensure that our neighbors have homes because it's a basic necessity and a right for everyone. And as uh, both Suzanne and Dean Flynn have mentioned, this is a good time. There's leadership here at the school through Dean Flynn. Uh, there's leadership at all levels of government. And uh, there's leadership at the, the helm of the university um, and throughout the local community. Um, there's just this convergence of resources and excitement and creativity that we want to be able to harness in the best way. So this conference is part of our contribution to that discussion and to try to help maintain it, to carry it forward. Um, after all, in Los Angeles right now, there are five major initiatives, count them, five major initiatives to eliminate homelessness. Uh, United Way Homes for Good, the Hilton Foundation, the City of Los Angeles, 
the County of Los Angeles, and last but not least, the University of Southern California. So um, we're pretty popular these days, huh? This is a topic that's finally getting the attention that it deserves. And I'm personally really happy about that because I don't see how we can have prosperity, how we can have any kind of social justice in our community with, the, with so many people suffering from housing insecurity. So now there's a lot of tables where people are working on the problem. And as Dean Flynn said, it is one of those wicked problems. It's so complex. There's a lot of competing constituencies. There's some resistance that's inborn to it. And it's gonna be difficult to say we've actually finally achieved it um, with finality. That's why I'm personally very glad and pleased to see all of you here. We need a lot of brains working on this and a lot of energy. A couple weeks ago, it was interesting because USC held a social change lab and um, a group of students and faculty got together and were talking about policies around social change in relation to homelessness. And the group that I was with, the students felt so strongly, I, I was really impressed. They wanted to make sure that people with lived experience had a seat at the table and that their knowledge and their experience would guide the process so that we're starting where they're at to create solutions. And today, I want to invite all of you to join us to have a seat at that table. Um, there is the tremendous en energy and creativity right here in this room because I know a lot of you and there is interesting solutions and um, excitement going on. Um, so we want to be able to look at the big picture and we're very fortunate because we have some speakers today who are going to give us some wild ideas and perspectives that can jump off our discussion, um, which will be really interesting. Everything from the community perspective, how do you get a huge bunch of people to actually get in one room and stay focused on one goal? That's pretty amazing. How do you get somebody to transform themselves in their role and how they work in partnership in the community? How do you get somebody's brain focused in a way that will contribute to the discussion? And how do you bring in technology as part of the discussion? So we've got a lot of wild ideas that are gonna be going on today, but we really want this to be a collaborative process so we don't want to just be talking at people um, because we're hoping that as you hear some of these things, it will be stimulating your own knowledge and your own ideas and, and that synergy can bring out some things that maybe give us a new perspective um, or help us to frame what we're doing in some new ways. And that will be a really important part of what we're gonna do. So each speaker will have a chance to talk for 15 minutes and then there'll be an equal amount of time for some discussion from the audience. And um, halfway through, we'll do a comfort break. Um, and there'll be a panel of social work students. We've had this year an enhanced field placement experience with a group of social work students who have um, been given in-depth knowledge and, and work ar and around policy and the whole topic of social work. So we want to hear from them. And actually, outside at the registration table, there's a sign-up sheet in case you would like to know more about that or have an agency or know of somebody that might might be interested in hosting some students. Um, and then after the speakers and the panel, we're gonna have a working lunch. Now you guys know there's no free lunch, right? Okay. <laughs> so we hope to have a diverse group at each of the tables. Um, that's why your name tags have different dots on them. You may not have noticed, but everyone has different colored dots. Um, so you get to make a rainbow at each table. There will be a facilitator to help with the discussion. And then we're giving everyone a worksheet and we would really like for you to jot down some ideas in each of the sections. 
um, based on the, the discussion that we've had, as well as um, any thoughts that come up for you. And what we're gonna do is actually take all of those and put together a white paper um, that will have uh, memorialized all of that um, wild and radical conversation um, that can, that can contribute to the discussion and the planning and the work that as we go forward. So your packets have bios, they have the agenda, they have the general USC stuff from the School of Social Work, and um, they also have a discussion worksheet, which was what we'll be using at the table um, for the lunch discussion. Um, and I really want to thank uh, Dean Flynn for her leadership in terms of homelessness on behalf of the university. Um, she has really um, played an important role in making sure that um, everything is able to move forward and has the, the support to be able to do that. Um, as well as uh, Dr. Suzanne Wenzel, her uh, department, which is the Department of Adults and Healthy Aging, um, along with Pam, who's the vice chair of that department, um, really did everything, the heavy lifting to put this conference on. So I just want to acknowledge them. They did have a team working with them, um, including Dr. Ben Henwood, uh, Dr. Seth Kurzban, uh, Dr. Kristen Zaleski, Professor Rusana Rowles, uh, Jessica Lee from our marketing department, and Adrian Lennis Little, who's the administrative manager. So thanks to all who've helped to get things ready for a day of wild work on homelessness. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. I do appreciate that. So we're going to amend that. I stand corrected. There are six major initiatives. And there may be more, some that I'm not as familiar with. So um, we'll hear about that as we go along. Um, and I appreciate that, that input. Um, that's what we want. There's a lot of knowledge and expertise in the room. And the more people that can know about it and the more people that can be um, part of that discussion, the better off we'll be. Now, we are going to get ready to go into the talks, and I'm not sure that I see Chris Coe. Is he in the room? He was running a little late and texted me. Where is he? Ah, there you are. Thank you for getting here. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start um, introducing our first speaker. Uh, Chris Coe, he's the director for United Way Home for Good. Um, actually, his official title is the director of systems and innovations for United Way of Greater Los Angeles. And he's involved with executing the collective impact work that Home for Good does. And he works across the leadership network to uh, try to address barriers and innovative long and innovate long-term solutions. In the past, he was involved with um, working on and developing the operation of the coordinated entry system, which is a really innovative, wide-scale approach to assessing and working with people who are homeless to get them linked into services, and very important. Um, he loves watching social change, and he's done a bunch of interesting things. He was an officer um, at a mentoring and tutoring program in West Philadelphia, a student at the University of Ghana, a volunteer at a Lib Liberian refugee camp, and an economic development policy aide for LA Mayor Vill Villaraigosa as well as many other things. Um, he's from, apparently, studied at the University of Pennsylvania and misses the trees and rivers of Richmond, Virginia, where he grew up. So I bet, I don't know about the weather, but I can understand that you might miss the trees and the rivers. So let's welcome Chris Coe. Thank you. Good morning. How are you guys doing? Doing all right? Waiting on the PowerPoint, I think. 
How is everyone? While we're waiting on that question, how many of you all, your full-time job is in the field of homelessness, so your job description has something in homelessness? Um, and shout it out if you are from outside that world. What else? Who else do we have? Yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm just faculty here. Faculty, wonderful. Yeah. Mm. And the issue of homelessness is very present and mm. very real for, for all of us. Absolutely. Anyone else? What brings you here? Wow. Wow. Anyone else from Echo Park? <laughs> <laughs> Any other neighborhoods representing? No? LA Health Plan. LA Health Plan, yes. Huge system that we need to get better linked in. All right. Back there, last one. Childcare child welfare. Child welfare. That is such an important system. Um, well, thank you for coming and being so interested. I think your attendance here, I'm sure, represents uh, your passions and your interests in this issue for our homeless neighbors. Um, the title, Brenda chose a much more interesting title for my talk than I chose for myself. Um, she asked me to do it, and I think we're all doing kind of TED-style talks on on different matters of innovations and homelessness. So rather than just go into the particulars of how things happened uh, just on Home for Good, I want to give a more general talk on some principles of how to get unstuck, kind of using some of the examples we had, but alternatively, just how to build together, what things we've learned around the way about how to build together. Um, what Brenda left off in my biography, most importantly, is that I'm named after a cooking oil. Uh, it's probably the most important part of my <laughs> biography, but um, everything else she said is true as well. Um, in the work of Home for Good, we Home for Good started uh, seeded through the Conrad and Hilton Foundation and with a lot of other support as a joint initiative with the Chamber of Commerce about seven years ago. And we've done a lot of things along the way and um, put together a lot of interesting things along the way. But the first principle, I would say, to how that all got going in some of the most interesting parts of large-scale change, principle number one, just get started. So I know this is shaping up to be a very interesting conversation. Um, this is the professional version of get out of bed in the morning and walk out the door, right? So anytime you're dealing with something that seems too complicated and too hard to think about, I think it's important to realize that there will never be a point at, w at which you have answered all the questions that people have of your work. There will be a point where you will have to begin to start regardless of there being outstanding questions to begin with. When we're looking at the coordinated entry system, uh, we are trying to figure out what does it look like to remake a homeless service delivery system for all of the service providers in LA County. The challenge with this is that LA is a huge place, and we're looking at creating a no wrong door system for Los Angeles. LA is a place where in the city limits, you have eight major cities, with Manhattan being the size of our 110 freeway. In our county, you have 40 of the 50 state capitals neatly fitting in, uh, with a capital in the Catalina and Avalon Islands. Um, in LA, when we are thinking about the systems to create and the systems to stitch between, you have benefits, you have outreach, you have different kinds of housing. We have four continuums of care, eight. Uh, six major housing authorities, 88 cities. So in the mass of things, and we're trying to create a system that stitches all this together, it was impossible to, to pick the perfect starting place, but we had to just choose. And so I'd say the first principle in our work, we chose a few spots. We started in Skid Row. We focused on adults. We looked at permanent supportive housing as the single intervention we wanted to first try delivering, working on the chronically homeless and using active outreach. Um, actually, Officer Dion Joseph was part of our very, very first meetings. So it's interesting to be full circle here. But all that to say, we picked a spot and we got going. Similarly, when we're talking about the lead up to measure H and Triple H, we were staring at this for a while. This is the resource chart that looks at what we needed to end or more significantly make a dent in homelessness and possibly end chronic homelessness. And if you look at this chart, it all seems very doable now. But two years ago, this was a daunting figure, right? We were glad to finally have the approach to look at 
But given that we had won uh, awards of $50 million at a time or $25 million at a time, these numbers seemed incredibly out of reach. But what we did, we put it in the grants of our systems change partners, and I don't know if any of our advocacy partners are here today, but we looked at the homeless count a few years back and realized we had to do something together that was bigger than any one of us. Uh, and this started, the march toward this started by just getting all of us in a room. We put a clause in the advocacy grants that said, you agree, when we figure out what we're doing, you agree to do that with us. It was kind of like, a, hey, can you help? You know, when your significant other tells you, hey, can you help me with something? They don't tell you what. They ask you first. Um, so we put that clause in not knowing what that was, no, but knowing that we needed to do something. And when we got in the room, we crafted this policy agenda under which in very fine print, there's a couple lines in here that talks about a dedicated source of funding amounting to at least $100 million. And again, we had no idea how we were going to do it, but we put it on paper and that went out to all of the home walkers. And with a thousand petitions, we began the march about a year or two years before um, the ballot measures began. The reason why it's important to get started is that as long as it's better than what exists, it's worth getting going. The status quo is not a uh, imaginary unicorn. Whatever is going on right now is a very real system and a structure and a policy. And so even if what you're seeking to create at scale is not perfect from the jump, if it is better than what exists for people like Henry that we saw on the street, um, it is worth our time and our efforts to get going. So that fear and insecurity that we have of getting going and knowing that it's not exactly what we want it to be or as good as it could be, overcome that and get going. So just start, principle number one, despite outstanding questions and because it exists. So two, collaborate and collaborate differently, which means one, don't set reasonable goals. Your goal, I think a key tenant in any work of large scale change is setting a goal that is truly going to require you to work with people you have never worked before. And why would you work with people you've never worked before? Because you're trying to do something you've never done before and you know you can't do without people you've worked with before. Um, so both in the Home for Good work itself, when we were looking at it, the Hilton Foundation had done work for 20 years. United Way had done work for 100 years. We had looked at um, a lot of the work in homelessness, and we were just at the end of a cycle where the county plan had just kind of fizzled at that point. Um, our Homelessness and Services Authority at that time was under uh, fiscal mismanagement review. Um, there are a lot of things going on at that time that spoke to the idea that there could not be a major aim achieved. But when we set the goal of let's try to end, let's end chronic homelessness and veteran homelessness in five years, it forced us to do things we wouldn't have otherwise done. And when we thought about, hey, how can we create a system that works together? How can we create a ballot measure together? All those things. You cannot create large-scale change if it is something that you know you can do by yourself. So don't set reasonable goals. Secondly, don't worry about involving everyone. I'll speak to that in a second. And don't let policymakers do everything. So in terms of not setting reasonable goals, the second part of it and the coordinated entry system and other things is that we set deadlines to the work. Not only did we set a goal, there were points at which in the pilot we said, we want to house 100 people in 100 days. The reason why deadlines are so important, two things. One, you're in large scale change, you're gonna be dealing with a lot of people who have done things before, have been asked to participate in committees and are kind of tired of it. Deadlines and time limited initiatives gives them a way to imagine a commitment that might not be eternal. This is the principle behind which why you are still subscribed to that magazine four years later that you swore you would cancel after that 30 day trial subscription, right? So the uh, deadline and that part helps you get involved, helps others get involved, but it also helps you practically do things at the last minute that you would have never done. So I think in work of large scale change, it's counterintuitive because the larger it is, the less it'll be. Uh, 
the more difficult it would be to imagine having a goal, but I think it is critically important um, to have a goal that especially has a deadline. This chart represents the group of people we started creating the coordinating tree system. And the people, the logos that aren't on this chart, do you know whose logo is not on this chart? Anyone who didn't want to be involved, right? So we began with the people who wanted to try it. So we call this the principle of the coalition of the willing. So a lot of times in large scale change um, and building, I think we spend a lot of time worrying about who we didn't invite um, or who we know might get their feelings hurt by not being involved. Um, this goes with another principle I'll say later, but if you just get going with the people who want to be doing the work, it gives you a much better chance of getting to the size you need to eventually scale and do it later. Um, and so we just got going with the people who said they wanted to be in. Um, the second part about this chart is that very intentionally, the group at the top and a huge tenant of this work is that don't forget that the heartbeat of any large scale change movement are the frontline staff or the program staff or the people on the ground who do the work. So typically in large scale change, usually this chart would be reversed, right? Usually you're starting with government partners or policymakers and then kind of filtering and trickling down to the frontline staff. But we intentionally, very intentionally flipped the model and chose it the other way and had a, um, had a principle that flipped policymakers into more policy advisors, policy shapers, enablers, and scalers. So what this group did, they commissioned the people on the ground to go out and do the work, but they didn't even have, they don't have time to do week over week meetings. So it worked in that people who had the time, who had the interest and the expertise were the ones at the center of the initiative um, and it worked out better for everyone involved that that was the case. So don't set reasonable goals, don't worry about involving everyone, don't let policymakers do everything. Use what you have, number three, it's the MacGyver principle. Um, for all of our friends in the room who remember the 80s and 90s. Um, so one day, this is where we started in the creation of the coordinating entry system. It's fun to put this slide up because we have actually achieved all the things that we said one day we might achieve. So years ago when we started this, this was a pipe dream. But we began in the era where we had no consent forms, no HIPAA compliance, um, kind of concerns around how we would share data. So we started with unique identifiers, Google Forms, Google Spreadsheets, figure out a way, and now it has forced the changeover of the entire HMIS system, um, created new consents across the database. Uh, we have a new survey that is now multi-part and addresses each population, and that's all there. And this is probably the most important and radical principle, if you're ready for it. Uh, it's not the principle of Phil Spector's hair. The principle is persistence, right? Resilience, endurance. I think in this world of innovation, and you know, I can speak to this as a millennial myself, we think rapid change, rapid, you know, on and off. I will tell you one of the biggest things I've learned in part of doing this, and the most important X factor in all this work has been persistence and a long-term commitment to the work. You will face a point in the work where your hair looks like that, where it is not quite the length you want it to be, but it's longer than the length that began, and you will be very tempted to chop it all off and go back to the beginning, but you have to stick through. Um, and I will say that's one of the, probably the single biggest thing why most large scale change initiatives will fail today, especially in our more modern era, is not appreciating that things of true scale and magnitude do take years and maybe even decades to go. So be patient and persistent. Um, allow for mistakes. Use a dimmer, don't flip a switch. I think the reason you're able to start small with a coalition of the willing, we imagine when we build large scale change, we imagine that moment where you are announcing this major thing on this major press conference and kind of telling the world. It builds up this unnatural pressure to force that first moment to be um, unrealistically successful. So we talk about using a dimmer on the large scale change piece rather than flipping a switch. Um, another thing to think about, 
large scale change does require risk taking at different points. And something that people often get frustrated by, I think naturally you go to a government partner to, to start in a leadership role around large scale change because they're the most visible. Having worked in the mayor's office, I will tell you one of the things that most people don't realize is that uh, there's a lot less than government partners can do than you think they can. Partly because we don't let them make mistakes. Us as taxpayers, us as a general public, us as readers of newspapers, do not allow our government partners to make the kind of mistakes that on the other hand, we want them to take. So in large scale change, having a private backbone organization or lead will practically enable you to take risks uh, that you cannot otherwise if you just have a government partner in the lead. Um, it is Government partners are critical, but we have achieved this relationship with our government partners now where they know that we can take, we have certain luxuries where if we do certain things, the LA Times won't write about us in the same way that they will about the Homeless Services Authority um, or other government partners. So knowing what your roles are, knowing what your strengths are important, have a coach, have coaches coach you, have a coach for your coaches. Because um, when you struggle and you are forgetting these principles, even the most strongest and most risk-taking and most boldest person at one point will forget that feeling. And you will need someone else to remind you of that. Um, so have a coach for your coaches is what that bag represents. Um, Finally, celebrate. So, huge thing, and how you celebrate. One, celebrate, just do it however you do it. But secondly, I would say, celebrate your wins in ways that go beyond press conferences, again, that go into ways that actually are lifting up the people who have done the work um, and presenting it in different ways. So instead of kind of a press conference, we introduced the coordinating truth system originally through an adult science fair. Um, and even during the Measure H conference, we had a press speaking portion of it, but very intentionally, I wanted to do an open mic portion that was much longer than the press conference portion, where we could hear from the people and really hear from uh, the ground of the movement of the people who had done the work and who have toiled at this for years and people had experienced homelessness and waiting for decades. Um, so and through all of that, just remember, again, who your heartbeat and the lifeblood of the movement is. Celebrate those and let them tell the story. It is much more powerful uh, for a program director or program staff sometimes to tell about why you need a policy change than the executive director. Um, so consider that in your celebrations. Um, finally, I would say, you know, this... For the longest time in celebrations, I think a way to do it and to think about it is... Um, Throw a better party than the other person. Make people want to come to your party. Um, Gandhi, for the longest time, when he was trying to convince India of clean water and the reforms needed for clean water, he was trying a lot of persuasion. At one point, he realized that instead of just trying to uh, logically argue why he needed this or that, there was a point where he just started lifting up two glasses of water. And he said, which one do you guys want? And I think in terms of building this, rather than trying to convince other people to jump into your initiative, just build something worth people being involved in and make that your principal aim over and over and over. So even in the coordinate entry system, we're consistently, like, how do we make this better and more user friendly? I will be the first to tell you, we know it's not there yet, but the aim of building something large and useful is always just to make it better and to make it more and more useful. Um, enough to do. So I'll stop with that for now and I'll close with something else. But um, I think now at this point, the opportunities we have to apply this to and the things that will require us to think about these kind of principles, uh, a couple of things I see. One, we have 10,000 units and 50, up to 15 possibly with no place like home and um, measure uh, ballot proposition triple H units. That's four times the number of permanent supportive housing we've built in the past. And so the amount of community, the echo parks of the world, um, that it's, we are gonna have community conversations really about what it means to invite our homeless neighbors into their communities will be a gigantic effort of large scale change. Um, and I think later down the line, the matter of severe mental health and what we do about those policies um, and how we humanely kind of balance that line between taking care of our homeless neighbors um, who 
who uh, suffer from severe, severe mental illness on the streets, I think will be two matters where um, we have challenges where we need to apply these principles to. The opportunity is that we finally, the new deadline that we've put on the clock is we can end chronic homelessness in 10 years. The ballot measures we've put together and we won together give us the resources to enable that in a very real way. And it is up to us to decide whether we want to um, do everything we can to achieve that. So thanks for having me, and uh, let's have a chat. Did you move the other table? I think I the table. Yeah. 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 yeah, questions based on what I had to say or did not say. Yeah. Anything you can even ask about. Pam, yeah. Hello. Right here. Yeah. Hi, my name is Alyssa Kuykendall. Um, I have a question for you about using media uh, outreach and I would call them even partners in a positive way, certainly with Prop H and Prop HHH, we saw that. Yeah. Um, and then for those of you who followed what happened in San Francisco um, with the media partnering around homelessness, Talk to us just briefly about what worked and what didn't work and then what you would recommend as we each go forward with our various initiatives about uh, communicating with and um, getting positive uh, assistance from the media. Yeah, so the question was about media. Um, what we took, I think one, it is to take advantage of whatever opportunities media affords you. Uh, because one principle is that the media, they're not your friends in the sense that they have no loyalty to you, right? So they may write the greatest article about your work one day and have a completely different side story, and it's not personal, right? You don't need to get your feelings hurt. On the opposite side, you cannot have the expectation that one good story will mean the second story will be well. What you should do, and I think what we took advantage of in both, um, is that know how the media does influence public opinion. So I think on the reactive piece, be set to react to it. The media had been writing a lot on um, encampments, right? And we were frustrated by how they were talking about homelessness, but on the, at the same time, rather than just trying to change the stories they were writing, we realized it actually presented an opportunity um, to take advantage of the public frustration with homelessness. And then along the way, I think having partners um, in the media where we did have relationships um, and working those angles were important. So I think something we did intentionally in editorial meetings or other pieces were to present a diverse set of partners and stakeholders. And it was important that the work to measure H and Prop Triple H built over for years. So one of the most important partners were our business partners. And you can't fake kind of passion and knowledge at that level, right? So by the time they got in front of the editorial board or testimonies, it was clear that they knew the content, they were experts, and that they cared. Um, and the editorial board and others were impressed by that, the fact that there were non-traditional partners. Because they expect, if you're a nonprofit, if, you, if your paycheck is going to be written by or benefited, even though it's not, even though that's not why you're doing it, there will always be a skepticism. Um, media will always be looking for the, um, there's a false equivalency right now with fair news that they will always want an opposing opinion. So the more you can go in equipped with people who don't represent just your talking line, it will help the story kind of overall be written um, to a, in a positive way. Hi, Denise McCain Thornstrom. I'm with Hi. Every Child Foundation and also a nonprofit Our Children LA have founded around homelessness. And I know you all have expanded a bit beyond chronic. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the efforts that you all are now also assisting to lead around the youth homelessness problem, those that are under the age of 25. Yeah, thank you for that question. So another large scale effort change that actually was the first thing seeded was the Funders Collaborative. Um, and that effort works to stitch all of our public and private funding together. We focused on chronic homelessness. I think even with our focus on chronic homelessness, we started realizing that chronic homelessness is fed and rooted in all forms of homelessness. And as we worked on systems that span uh, even the single adult side, we realized that spanned every system. 
And so that's really led us into considering and um, starting this year in an RFP out that we have today. So you can, I think it's unitedwayla.org slash grant seekers. Um, but you can find our home for getla.org slash grant, speaker, grant seekers. But that um, you can propose now. We are starting to expand kind of support for ideas and initiatives that stitch into other systems. One uh, priority system that we have is the foster care system um, and other pieces like that that we know really feed long-term homelessness. So we are absolutely um, want to address the broader systems of homelessness and, and bring a pathway home for all of our neighbors. So this year we're starting to make inroads into that and really take more proactive steps in the following years. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, I wanted to just follow up on the Yes, sir. And, uh, <clears throat> what the lady said about the youth uh, problem. Yes. You, you have two you know, two ends. You have the adult homeless, mm -hmm. but there's a younger age, especially with the people of color. That's right. That are, <clears throat> uh, it's kind of like, uh, you're going to work on this problem, but you're going to have a constant stream mm -hmm. of people coming in from the lower end. Yep. And if you look at the issues they're dealing with is we're finding a lot of young people now that are, homeless, mm -hmm. and they're living from house to house, garage to garage, mm -hmm. and it's due to blended family issues. Mm -hmm. It's due to, it's deal with uh, absent fathers and single parents, mm -hmm. and uh, those issues are complicated. You know, they compound, and so, um, I mean, I, I'm just wondering if, I, it's a big problem. I, mm -hmm. I know you, it's, it's a lot of resources, but uh, there's a population that is building up Yes. Building up, and they're going to end up on the street. So uh, there has to be, uh, uh, like you say, supportive service, but there has to be a, a preventive component. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I, don't, I don't have the answers, uh, but one of the things that I see in Pomona is they're uh, creating volunteers for mentors. Mm -hmm. And these mentors uh, track these kids, and they journey with them, mm -hmm. and they connect with them. Mm -hmm. and, and, and as they go through their walk, they're, they're, you know, they're walking with them and they're dealing with their issues, making sure they're connected to resources and et cetera, et cetera, so that they don't end up in uh, homeless because you see the big problem, you know, they end up uh, falling out of school. There's an education component. They get in trouble with the authority of the police. There's drugs and alcohol. There's uh, teen pregnancy. And, uh, <clears throat> and, you know, and then there's suicide and it goes on and goes on. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I don't know if you're just, you know, if that's something that you're kind of thinking about and... Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, youth homelessness, two things about youth homelessness. One, there is a, a much higher overlap already, even with chronic homelessness, than people realize, right? So there is a lot of youth who are already chronically homeless, believe it or not, for one. So we should not think of them as mutually exclusive populations. Um, even in the pilot of the coordinated entry system with chronically homeless persons, uh, like in areas like Hollywood, I think a full quarter to a half of some of the housing placements were with youth. So it is, I think, at that age, people are shocked to realize that many of them have already experienced chronic homelessness or experiencing it. And yeah, I think on the second front, we it is absolutely a feeder into the other pieces, and that's why we are looking. So this year, we'll be looking at research to see how do we go down the line. And then the systems, like I mentioned, the coordinated entry system we built, the first system that we expanded it to um, was youth uh, in an intentional way. So the coordinated entry system for youth exists now and is about to be stitched back together with the adult system. Because the other thing I will say why it's not helpful for us to have such distinct buckets, I get calls from people. I've gotten called, and I purposely take them because I want to hear what's going on. There's a woman who called me. Uh, she started by saying you know, she needed help, and she was uh, 22 years old. Throughout, in the course of the conversation, as we talked more, I discovered that she actually had a child she was separated from, who was caring, you know, being taken care of by the foster care system. So she's a, a young mother. She fits into the 18 to 25 bucket, so she's technically a transition age youth. And she was fleeing, fleeing a situation of domestic violence. Right, so what is she? What system does she belong in? Is she an adult? Uh, is she a family? Is she? transition age youth, is she a DV survivor? She is all of those things. And so the units of measure we used to organize ourselves often are not the identities our homeless neighbors have. And I think it's important for us to recognize that. And even on our work this year in the Funders Collaborative, we are seeking to break down those walls and create systems that really 
integrated across them. Because the main things that people struggle with to get home right now in this market, housing vacancies, people cannot find an apartment. Um, people cannot find help with applications and benefits, assistance, employment, all those things. It doesn't matter who you are. Some populations struggle with that more. But there are things, there are large scale issues that really touch all of our populations. I think we're used to advocating for a certain population over another. But um, I think if we open our eyes to some of the bigger scale issues, we might find more commonality than, than we realize. Last question. Yeah to respond to. Um, are there any barriers or obstacles that you have experienced or run across that you would like to see United Way and Chris weigh in on um, and help with? Yeah, right here. Hi, my name is Ryan. I'm from Volunteers of America. Um, one of the biggest barriers I've seen are people who fall out of housing. I think that the, the closer we get to a functional zero with people who are living on the streets by p placing them in permanent supportive housing if they're so lucky and getting services is simple systems. Simple systems like Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, Southern California Edison, the gas company, Department of Public Social Services, and the Social Security Administration. When simple mistakes occur in getting paid something, uh, their GR gets turned off or something gets withheld and the client doesn't know enough and doesn't feel is, or is too proud to actually talk to their social worker. And so what ends up happening, or DWP miscalculates and then they get this huge bill. So, and then it takes months to do that. And if they're receiving a subsidy, that they will fall out of housing and they will become evicted. And so I wanted to understand what can the United Way do to assist with that? And I think across this county, because that's one of the things that we're going to encounter more and more the, the closer we get to a functional zero, is we're going to see a lot more need for prevention to, to prohibit people from falling out of housing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, and we'll end with that because of time, I know. Um, prevention, I think the, one of the strongest measures of prevention, prevention is such a hard research category, but one of the things we know already as a stated, one proven area that we need prevention is in retention. So one of the most likely persons to become homeless are people that have been homeless already. And so I think that is a huge area of focus for us. Something practically we're doing is in the Measure H work, we are really stressing that point on the matter of services to help on retention. We've never had it, you're right. Our ratios in housing have been as high as one to 100. So there's no way we're taking care of our neighbors inside well. It's part of why Measure H was so critical and why we couldn't have done it without it. So we are moving now to ratios like 1 to 25, 1 to 20 that are much more reasonable uh, just on the funding side to make that there and make that whole. It's, it's nice to be able to even f worry about retention because we're having enough people come inside to worry about keeping them inside and we'll absolutely keep up that fight. Uh, one other practical thing we're looking at, we run the utility assistance program for Southern California Edison, DWP, a gas company, and we're looking at how those triggers for help with the utility assistance bills can be triggers for us, practical triggers into other forms of homeless assistance is one thing we're doing. I think the other thing we're aiming to do is that we realize retention goes beyond clinical services. Ending homelessness is really, at the end of the day, about recreating community and recreating neighborhoods. Uh, we don't want people to just come inside. Retention means more than staying in a room. It means reintegrating in a community and a society. And I think that's something we're really aiming to stress and stretch out in. And I think um, the reason I want to end on this point is that I think it, it relates to it relates to the last measure of large scale change that's important is that you'll be, we often are so focused on other people we need to bring along and change, but truly you will not be able to sustain a truly radical large scale change effort without facing uh, the demons and barriers and fears of yourself. And I think the fears of ourselves. And a lot of what we are worried about with our homeless neighbors, if we're honest with ourselves, are things that we should be worried with ourselves, right? The sense of modern isolation and loneliness is something that we all deal with and that we all fear for. 
And if we are honest about that, I don't think any of us have the level of relationship with our neighbors that we seek to have. And so I do believe in something that I'm aiming for is not only to end chronic homelessness, but to recreate communities and neighborhoods in the process. I think that's the biggest opportunity we have. And the biggest thing our homeless neighbors can do for us is teach us all how to be neighbors again. Because in their story and struggle, they will be reflecting more transparently, I think, the fears and the difficulties we all have living in the society. Um, so the last quote I'll leave you with that has fueled me through this is from a book called Servant Leadership. It says, who is the enemy Who's holding back more rapid movement to the better society that is reasonable and possible with available resources? Who is responsible for the mediocre performance of so many of our institutions? Who's standing in the way of a larger consensus on the definition of the better society and the paths to reaching it? It's not evil people. It's not stupid people. It's not apathetic people, not the system, not the protesters, the disruptors, the revolutionaries, the reactionaries. The real enemy is fuzzy thinking on the part of good, intelligent, vital people and our failure to lead and to follow other servants as leaders. Too many settle for being critics and experts. There's too much intellectual wheel spinning, too much retreating into research, too little preparation for and willingness to undertake the hard and high risk tasks of building better institutions in an imperfect world. Too little disposition to see the problem as residing in here and not out there. In short, the enemy is strong natural servants who have the potential to lead but do not lead or who choose to follow a non-servant. They suffer, society suffers, and so it may be in the future. So I'll leave you with that um, to consider that it is beyond the time where we can point at each other. Let's point at ourselves. Let's reflect deeply, understanding that we will have to be prepared to create transformative changes in ourselves to see large scale change outside of ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. That was outstanding and a great way to kick off our speakers. Thank you so much. Well, I'm very pleased to be able to introduce our next speaker. And if you had other questions that got raised from that discussion, make notes on your pad and bring them up in your lunch discussion. So let's move on. Um, I'm pleased to introduce Dion Joseph. He's a homeless advocate, an inspirational speaker, and a law enforcement consultant who's been working with the LAPD for 20 years, 17 of those on Skid Row. He's worked in collaboration with a lot of social service agencies and become involved with multiple projects to help the community in creative ways, including housing, job opportunities, hygiene kits, and a bunch of other stuff. So I can't wait to hear Dion Joseph. Thank you so much, everybody. I appreciate being here. It's an honor to be amongst so many people who really care, and that's the greatest thing about being here. Um, I'm Dion Joseph, been with the LAPD 20 years, 18 years in Skid Row. I know I have a limited amount of time to uh, give you a lifetime of heartbreak. Um, I, my mantra in my entire life, in my entire career, working in Skid Row has been this to create an environment conducive to change so that the influence of the great people like you and other service providers can be stronger than that of the criminal element. And I've lived by that, I've worked by that. I am not coming to you from a police perspective. I hate that term with all my heart. I'm coming to you from the perspective of a human being who happens to be a police officer because there's two groups who become overly demonized in this conversation, and that's law enforcement as well as the homeless. And when that happens, we'll just come to Skid Row, and you'll see the results of that. So what I really want to do is, first I want to put in context what Skid Row is. I want to humanize the people of Skid Row, and then I want to tell you the truth about Skid Row. Now, i got a limited amount of time, so since I can't really espouse everything, I've seen in 18 years. A picture's worth a thousand words. I wanna advise you there are some photos in there that may be disturbing, but my hope is it'll create the sense of urgency in your heart that's in my heart to fix this problem. Together, not separately. So with that, let's talk about what Skid Row is real quick. <clears throat> Skid Row 
is a 50 block radius that's deemed a recovery zone. It's called a recovery zone because it had 107, now 108 programs designed to help the homeless uh, in Skid Row with a myriad of issues, whether it be mental illness, alcohol abuse, shelter, domestic violence, you name it, it's there. Hope is a trip and fall away. The only thing Skid Row can't do is house everybody. That's a crisis we're all struggling with in California, okay? What's unique about Skid Row is that being a recovery zone in the center of Los Angeles and its close proximity to Compton, Watts, Los Angeles, and other cities, Long Beach, where I grew up, <laughs> LBC, Jack Rabbit, <laughs> LBPD, love you guys. <laughs> because of its close proximity and the disenfranchisement of the people from there, Skid Row is the only show in town for them. Unlike your favorite celebrity, when they need to get clean from cocaine, alcohol, and methamphetamines, where do they go? Betty Ford, Malibu, passages to get away. They're doing yoga, horses are running around. It's fantastic. <laughs> to keep them from the temptation to fail, we all agree that's common sense, right? In Skid Row, the disenfranchised people of Skid Row have to get clean in an environment that can easily be compared to Dante's Inferno, Mad Max Thunderdome, Waterworld. How do you get clean when the drug dealer is not only inside the drug program, but outside? How do you get clean in a low-income supportive housing facility when the drug dealer knocks on your door and says, hey, try this or I'll kick your ass? This happens to the people of Skid Row. That's why I'm not gonna candy coat anything today. I'm gonna tell you a lot of bad things, but before I do that, let me humanize the people of Skid Row who I love with a passion, a passion, okay? There are four groups of people in Skid Row like anywhere else in the city of Los Angeles, state of California, anywhere else. This is nationwide, like anywhere else. In Skid Row, there are good people, good, wonderful, good-hearted people who are just poor, disenfranchised, trying to do the best they can to get on their feet. There are thousands of people like that in Skid Row, and I love them. That's why I'm there. The second group is good people who do bad things. These are your addicts who, when they're clean and sober, you find out they're educated, they're talented, they're kind-hearted, they're lovable people. But let's be real, folks. Some of the people that will hug me and shake my hand when they're binging on crack cocaine and they've run out of their check, they will bust you upside the head to get exactly what they need. You can't separate drug addiction and drug dealing from violent crime. I know we're in an era where they're trying to say it's different. No, you can't separate it. It's all in a big, ugly ball. It's a big, ugly ball, folks. You have bad people with redemptive qualities, for a lack of ter better terms. When we had Skid Row clean and safe, relatively, from 2006 to 2010, we had ex-gang members, drug dealers, and homeless people starting three-on-three -three basketball leagues, cleaning the street better than the city of Los Angeles. If any of the major people's in here, don't be offended. I'm just keeping it real. We gave them trash cans, brooms, and they took their community back because we broke the back of the criminal element. And when you do that, the real community comes out and it brings out the best in many people. I saw a gang member stop a rape. I don't think he would have done that prior to the Safer Cities Initiative. I don't think he would have done that. And then the last group is career criminals. These are hundreds upon hundreds of gang members, drug dealers, loan sharks who descend upon Skid Row to prey on the wonderful people I serve and keep them on an endless, addiction, uh, uh, endless, endless spiral of addiction and crime. <coughs> they do it every day, folks. And what frustrates me as a law enforcement officer is that's the part, the victimization of the people of Skid Row is what the media and the world completely ignores. Why? Well, we don't want to create a stigma. Well, you not creating a stigma is putting these people I love in danger. You're not creating a sense of urgency. You're not creating a sense of ur urgency. Now, let me tell you what's different about those four groups in Skid Row juxtaposed to the groups across the United States of America. Same, here's the difference. Because Skid Row is so concentrated you know, it was created by two ideologies, the, the super, super, super righties, NIMBYism, get them out of here, <laughs> ship them down to Skid Row so we have to close down the asylum, close down all the help. And then the super, super lefties who says, take your hand off them, let them do what they want to do. That's all they have, okay? So 
In these four groups, this is what it looks like in Skid Row. The good person has to look the other way so they don't become a victim of crime themselves. There are people who want to report crime. They tell me all the time they want clean, safe, healthy streets, but they're afraid to voice it because they don't want to get their butt whooped. They don't want to be a good witness to a homicide, okay? For the good person that does bad things, they stay on the bad side longer because the temptation to fail is right at their front door, okay? For the bad person, for lack of a better term, with redemptive qualities, he or she has a choice to make. If I can't beat them, I might as well stay with them because this is where the money is. And for the criminal element, they pull all the strings and make us look like the bad guys when we try to stop it. It's incredible. You have to take a walk with me. You have to take a walk with me. I want to explain to you the lure of the criminal element in Skid Row. Why do so many criminals descend upon Skid Row and prey on them? I'm kind of a demonstrative, demonstrative guy, okay? I worked undercover from 1991 to 2000, 1999 to 2001. It was one of my favorite gigs, and I did it in Skid Row. One of my favorite uniforms at the time <clears throat> was to put on a beanie, a white tank top, some jailhouse blue pants, some white socks and flip-flops, and back then I was in shape and I had these little scrawny legs so everybody thought I got out of prison anyway, right? <laughs> and I had a jailhouse wristband. And I would walk down the 600 block of San Julian, the heart of Skid Row, and we would be looking for gamblers, gang members who were gambling drug money that they made off the backs of the Skid Row people, okay? So here I am, I'm in character, I'm right there in the middle of a dice game, 7-Eleven, 7-Eleven, 7-Eleven. And then I look up, I give my partner a signal, violation, ding, they come running in their patrol cars. And guess who goes running to? Me. One time, I'm out of here. It looked better than this, but I don't want to fall off the stage. <laughs> anyway, uh, so as I'm running, a high-ranking member of the Crips, I don't know if you guys know this, the Crips and Bloods work together in harmony in Skid Row to prey on the people. He's chasing me, and he says, slow down, cuz. Cuz, slow down. And I was like, what's up, dog? He goes, hey, man, slow down, man. I can't catch you, man. Uh, come here, let me highlight you. I said, what's up? He says, man, you just get out? I'm like, yeah, been in the glass house for about a year. He goes, oh, okay, can you, you strong, man. Can you fight? I'm like, yeah, I'm nice with these. What's up? <laughs> he goes, oh, oh, bro, you need some work? I was like, hell yeah. Yeah, I need some work. He goes, okay, you see that guy right there? You see that old lady in that tent right there? You see that little Asian chick right there? They owe me money. I will pay you $50 a day to bust their head to the white meat till I get it back. Thanks, bro. Went down the street, he got arrested, we took him, took his dope money. We still had three hours left in our shift. My boss says, we can't leave, folks. Let's get back out there and let's get some, go get some prostitutes. Now, I hate the term prostitute with a passion because many of the women who are engaged in prostitution in Skid Row and beyond are scarred. They're victims themselves. But for the sake of scenario, prostitutes. So I kept the same uniform on. Beanie, tank top, band-aid, jailhouse wristband, jailhouse blues, flip-flops. And my boss says, you ain't gonna get no girls looking like that. I was like, watch me, I'm chocolate thunder, baby, come on. <laughs> And as I'm walking in the area of 7th and Stanford, this attractive but weathered young girl, she couldn't have been more than 23 years old, she flags me down and says, hey, hey, daddy, hey, daddy. I said, hey, what's up, boo? She goes, you, you, you need a date? You look like you've been away for a while. I said, hell yeah, I need a date, girl, what's up? Right? She looks at me and says, okay, I charge 20 for this, 40 for that, and I won't do that. You know what? Stop. Wait, wait. I said, what's wrong? She said, my dude got locked up. He got sent away for 10 years. You got a place to stay? Like the homie's trying to get me some SRO. She goes, no, nah, forget that. You know, I, I live at the Ford Hotel. Look, you can come stay with me. You can have me for me, me for free. I'll give you all the money. I just need you to protect me. In the span of three hours, I had a job 
a girlfriend, a place to stay, and a tax-free income because at the time I had talent. How dare you be a parole agent and send your parolee or probationer down the skid row and then put your finger in their face and say, stay out of trouble. There's so many things in skid row happening down there that don't make sense, but yet we still buy into the narratives that aren't working. The ideologies that have proven to fail, they're not working, okay? The poor quality of life drives the violence, drives the drug sales. Where do you think drug dealers hide their guns? Where do you think they hide their women? Where do you think they hide their dope? In the tents, do you know in Skid Row, a gang member controls every block of Skid Row, whether it be Bounty Hunter, Grape Street, East Coast Crips, Hoover, they control, and they get along. And if you try to set up a tent in Skid Row, they're coming for you. You set up on my block, you got to put in work. So now you got homeless people who become drug dealers. Some of them are forced to, others are willing participants to support their habit or pay off their drug debts. That's Skid Row. That's Skid Row too, okay? You can't separate it. The tents are up, the garbage is up, and as a result, crime is up. I'll prove it. From 2006, 2010, we had those tents down. Thank you. We had those tents down from 9 to 6. We allowed them to sleep. We understood that. There's no places for them to go. But from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m., you're not just going to sit on the sidewalk and destroy yourself and others. And it worked. How dare you tell me you're an advocate for the safety of homeless women, but yet you're okay with the environment that puts them in danger? Because let me tell you, folks, just tell you something, folks. If I can't see them being raped, I can't save them. If I can't see them being humanly trafficked, I can't save them. I can't see a man overdosing in a tent. I can't save him. The fire department can't save them. And since I'm running out of time, and I wish I had more time to walk this out, let's just switch over to the other most important issue, OK? The most important issue that I see in Skid Row is mental illness. Allow me to walk this out, please. It's affecting all of us, but nowhere. Skid Row is the mecca for all things homeless, but it's where everybody wants to shift their mentally ill. America's solution to mental illness currently is to shut down the asylums and sue so we can't bring them back and <laughs> sprinkle pills on the mentally ill and kick them out in the streets in the name of civil liberties. For some, they fall into the arms, arms of family members and support. For many, they end up coming down to Skid Row. And with their prescription pills, Skid Row is off the chain. I can't survive Skid Row looking like this, feeling like this from my medication. So they sell their prescribed medication to make enough money to buy methamphetamines, crack cocaine, spice, and marijuana, which exacerbates their condition. Ladies and gentlemen, you're talking to a Los Angeles police officer. Those Long Beach police officers, we will be the first ones to tell you that being mentally ill is not a crime. Being paranoid schizophrenic is not a crime. Being paranoid schizophrenic on, on spice, that's a whole other issue, okay? Why is it an issue? Because there's a chemical buffer between, let's say you're paranoid schizophrenic and you're having a crisis, but now you just smoke some spice and it got to your receptors and that crisis is a hundredfold. If it was just paranoid schizophrenic, I know there's voices in your head, just hear my voice. Now that you're on spice, there's a chemical buffer between me, the law enforcement officer trying to help you, and your crisis. How do I help you when you think I'm a six foot alligator trying to bite you? Which is why uses of forces happen. It's not for a lack of training or a lack of compassion. It's that chemical buffer and that's what the papers always seem to leave out. But anyway, what are the tools they gave us? And I'm gonna end on this note because I, <clears throat> I wish I had more time. What are the tools they gave police departments to quote unquote, help the mentally ill in Skid Row. Okay, 5150, three prong approach. First prong, let's talk about it. Danger to themselves. I got a story. 1998, my partner, Big Joe Graves, walking the footbeat, the two officers crazy enough to walk a footbeat in 1998 in Skid Row. 
Now, I'm not the hero in this story. He was. I was eating a bacon-wrapped hot dog, and it was delicious. <laughs> and as we're walking, we're talking about how bad the Lakers suck. We're glad Shaq's here. And out of the cor corner of my eye, boop, my partner disappears. Where the heck did he go? I saw him jump into the street and grab a woman who looked like a soccer mom and snatch her from the path of an all-coming city bus. I hooked her up, dropped my delicious hot dog. Man, what the heck are you doing? She said, I heard voices telling me to kill myself, so I did. We take her to the station, we get her evaluated. Ding, 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 ding. The, uh, the evaluator said, take her to the hospital. LAPD saves the day, right? We dropped her off at the hospital. Three hours later, we get another call. Go to Cesar Chavez in Broadway. We get there, the same woman we rescued at 6 and San Julian successfully turned herself into a pizza. Who failed that woman? The LAPD, the Long Beach PD, or the system? There's a common thread with these prongs in these stories. I'll try to make them quick, I promise you. <laughs> I just gotta get it out. Danger to others. There's a friend of mine, we call her Jenny. I've known Jenny for 18 years. I remember when she was a teenager. Developed schizophrenia, started using drugs, became exacerbated, and you would often find Jenny laying face down on the sidewalk, banging her head on the concrete. I was the only one who would stop her. Jenny, please stop. Okay, but when I walk away, bang, 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 and then I'd have to take her to a hospital. For 72 hours, right? Come on, we all know it's not 72 hours. We have a fun event in the historic core called Art Walk. And it's a time for hipsters to come together and look at art and drink. <laughs> we had a beautiful hipster family walk in. Hipster mom had a beard, hipster dad had a beard, hipster baby had a beard. <laughs> Everybody's wearing flannel, it was great. <laughs> Jenny escaped from Skid Row <laughs> and was walking, enjoying the art. Not a crime. But she was in crisis. And she walked up behind his family and saw that baby, that three-month-old baby in a stroller. And while the parents weren't looking, grabbed the baby by the leg and started slamming it against the street, against the pole. This happened, folks. We had to arrest Jenny for a crime. Jenny went to jail. Jenny got out in four months. Who failed Jenny? Who failed that family? Us or the system? Last, last story, and I'm done. Grave the disabled, another wonderful tool they give us <laughs> to help the mentally ill. 2004, a man had just got out of prison. He was six foot four, 275 pounds of pure muscle. Thank God he liked me. I know my limitations. <laughs> I met him, we had developed a rapport, and then one day he told me, Joseph, I have cancer. Can you pray for me? Bro, I got you. I got you, man, but go take care of yourself, man. Take care of yourself. This man had cancer, but he chose crack cocaine over cancer. I was wondering where he was. was. I didn't see him for two years, but someone said he was in the tent somewhere. Now, this is a picture of my day. No one in this room, other than probably the police officers back there, had a day like this. 2005, I'm driving to 5th and San Julian. I see a man sitting on the sidewalk holding his head and then holding his stomach. I said, sir, you okay? He said, Robo, they stabbed me, bro. I said, who got you? He says, that Cuban guy down the street, ponytail, red shirt with trees on it. I said, bro, I'm gonna call the ambulance. I'll meet you at the hospital. I'm gonna go get him right now. This is before the Safer Cities Initiative, folks. I'm driving down the street trying to find the suspect and there are people in the street smoking, joking, laughing. They won't even get out of my way so I can go find us. Lawlessness was driving crime in Skid Row. I finally get to 6th and San Julian. I cross the street and I see my favorite news reporter at the time, Anderson Cooper and Deputy City Attorney Jose Agrabiti doing a piece on Skid Row. I didn't have time for star, uh, star sightings. I had to go find a suspect. So I drove past them and I saw a crowd of guys waiting for a bus to go to a shelter away from Skid Row. I'm big on decentralization, folks. When I got out of the car, I'm about to, I see my guy and I tell him the guys to move out of my way. My friend, 68 year old woman by the name of Mama Grouch was being threatened by a six foot one female gang member. 
I arrested the gang member and throw him in the backseat of my car. I still got an ADW suspect to get. I go through the crowd, and I think I see my guy. And as I'm pulling out those handcuffs, I trip. And I look down. And the same man I saw in 2004, who was six foot four, 275 pounds, was now six foot four, 86 pounds, dead on the sidewalk. Oh, I thought he was dead. But of course I do my due diligence. Oh man, that's sad. Hundreds of people around, nobody called the ambulance, nobody called the police. I'll just check his pulse, see if he's got some life in him. And as I'm checking his pulse and counting, I feel something on my fingers and I look, and these two fingers were covered with maggots from an abscess that he failed to take care of. I said, this guy's dead. As I'm about to call for a supervisor, he does this. <sighs> Robo, just let me die. I got two days left. I, I, I just want to go. I said, bro, you ain't dying on my side. <laughs> Called an ambulance, took him to the hospital. He lived for five days, but he died in some dignity. What's the common thread with all of those stories and all of those prongs? That it forces the police, the fire department, Department of Mental Health, and other resources to be after the fact entities for people in need. You can't expect to change somebody's life in 72 hours. It takes four weeks, six weeks, for their medication to even take effect. But they still put it on the backs of the police. I wish to God I had more time to walk out, walk it out. But I want to thank you so much for your time. God bless you. Oh, OK. We have just a little bit of time for questions. Um, and actually, there's one question that I have for you. Uh, what was one thing that you, let's see, I know that, not that one. Um, what, it, what do you think it takes to create hope for someone living on the street for a long time? Mm. You know what? One of the things that we're taught as police officers, and uh, of course, you guys don't read about this in the paper, but when you suit up, you leave your worldview at your locker. Everybody has a worldview. You'll be lying. Anyone who says they don't is lying. When I put my locker on, when I'm at my locker and I put on my uniform, I'm a born again Christian and proud of it. But if a Muslim, a Jewish person, an atheist needs my help, I will go balls to the wall to help them. I am straight as a bone. But if I find out that you hurt somebody from the LBGQ community, TQ community, I promise you, you're going to have a 250-pound legal problem on your hands. <laughs> I'm an American citizen and proud, American through and through. But if a woman comes to me and says, I'm being raped, and my attacker tells me if I tell the police, he's going to call La Migra on me, it is my duty to tell her, I will not. I want to help you. So I think what gives the people of Skid Row hope as it relates to me and other officers, I'm not the only one, I'm just the one with the mouth, <laughs> uh, is the fact that that's how we serve. I've been told by people, I'm a light in a dark place. I've been told by people, I feel safe when you're around. One quick story on that. There was a guy who, uh, uh, there was a lady who owed a loan shark $500 in Skid Row. Uh, I was on vacation. I couldn't help her. When I got back, she said, Joseph, while you were on vacation, you saved my life. I'm like, how the hell did I do that? I was on vacation chilling with her, right? <laughs> she says, this loan shark, she was going to, uh, he, he said, if I didn't pay her back, pay him back, he was going to send his people and I was going to catch a fade. Now, for you guys don't, who don't know the lingo, catching a fade means you're going to get your ass whooped. That's what it means, right? So I said, so what'd you do? I told him I was going to call the police. I said, what'd he do? She said, he broke out laughing. Hmm. And then I thought about it, Joseph, and I said, you know what? I'm going to call Joseph. <laughs> and he looked at her and said, don't get that big Negro involved. You got two more weeks. <laughs> and she ended up not having to pay it because she never owed it in the first place. See, what you guys don't know about Skid Row is the gangsters are now taxing people just for coming outside their door. So we give them hope when they see this uniform. They won't say it to the press. <laughs> the press won't report it anyway if they did. 
but we give them hope. We do. Yeah, I, I wanted to comment. Um, I work in the city of Pomona. I don't know how it is in Skid Row, but um, what I come across is uh, the normal thing, the routine is mental illness, mm -hmm. substance abuse. Mm -hmm. There's veterans now. Mm. That number is increasing, but what I find more and more is men and women who are not mentally ill, not into substance abuse, they're not veterans, they're just people who have lost their jobs, mm -hmm. their families. I hear a lot of stories where their spouses have died because of illnesses. Mm -hmm. They get depressed, you know, and they end up losing their job and they're out in the street. Mm -hmm. So this population is growing. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know how we say we want them to be part of the community, integrate in the community. I, I was thinking is we have to work with the uh, businesses in the community, see if they could take a chance on these people because they get stereotyped because they're in a population. You know, it's just like before when I was young, all Mexicans were gangbangers. No, that's not true. I had mean, the same you know, problem, brother. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So <clears throat> they have to adopt to the environment in order to survive. Mm -hmm. But they need a they need a break. They need a, you know some business to take a chance. I don't know if we could do a stipend or with a business or something. The city could do something to encourage them. That's one. The second thing you said that I think is real important. We've been talking about in some way alluding to the fact that we're we're dealing with external needs like housing. That's important. But there's internal needs. Mm -hmm. If you don't change that, they're not going to be able to maintain. Uh, the blessings or the benefits of the external. So yeah, you, you talked about it. It's real important. Uh, there's a lack of hope. There's a lack of vision. They lost their ability to dream. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a whole issue. What if this happened? I could ex succeed in all that. So I, I, I don't have the answers, but I, I know what I'm doing is, is that as I go out and rub shoulders, I learn their names, their story. Mm -hmm. And I take a few men or women and I track them. Yeah. Okay, I track them, and and I journey with them, and, mm -hmm. you know, and and I I hear where they're at, where they're failing, encourage them, support them, take them, you know, to because they don't know how to navigate the resources, you know. Mm -hmm. They they uh, I have to say it's sad, but they they're mistreated. Yes. Uh, people can't uh, handle their their appearance or their walk or their talk. Mm -hmm. or their smell or the odor. Right. And so they get shortchanged and then they, they, get, they get a bad attitude and they, they just quit. Well, so, what happens, not, and I agree, everything you said is 100% right. I see it in Skid Row too. Everybody in Skid Row is not a drug addict, okay? There are people who come down there because of hard times, domestic violence. And the worst thing that happens is because we're not offering them services that can connect them quick enough, they often get stuck. They get stuck, and that's what I try to be. When I see them, I get them straight to the mission. Normally, those folks stay downtown for like three, six months and get connected, but it's a little slower, I can admit, due to the recession, and we're still recovering. Uh, but I, the second part is, is the, the most marginalized classes within these groups, and that would be women and children. In Skid Row, uh, women make up 40% of that population, but in that... In that group, two-thirds of them have been victims of sexual assault twice. And that's even why it's even more urgent for us to really reach out and connect to these men and women and children and get them. And just like you said, these business people, there's a lot of philanthropists that, philanthropists that talk a lot of crap. They don't put any money into helping get people off the streets. Brother, I'm with you. I'm with you. I like what Chris said. There's only so much the government can do. But there are people, there are billionaires out there who all they want to do is give them tents and food and think they've done their job. No. Why don't you build housing for the homeless? Why don't you help decentralize and put family centers in other parts of L.A. County and the, and the state to get people away from Skid Row where they have a better chance? So, yeah, really the solution is within us. But like Chris said, sometimes us doesn't want to move. So, yeah. Last comment. Thank you so much. We're going to need Thank you. Questions. We have one more question. One more just one. Okay. Okay. He'll be quick. I'll be quick. He's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there we go. Officer Joseph, I was wondering if you could speak briefly about uh, your thoughts about the proposal to uh, create a Skid Row Neighborhood Council. Because on one hand, we hear that, uh, that Skid 
Greensboro, the neighborhood would be better served through being part of the downtown neighborhood council. Mm -hmm. And yet there's a feeling tone of, of anger that, that council's not doing enough. So I'm just curious what your thought was about uh, the proposition. Well, here's my personal thought. I'm off duty, so I can say this. <laughs> Personally, I think Skid Row should have a voice. I absolutely believe it. Uh, I agree that the downtown neighborhood council may not have, and it, I don't think it was intentional, may not have been as receptive to them uh, as they should have been. My issue with the Skid Row neighborhood council is a couple of people who are behind it. That scares me to death. Now, for me, if those people are gone, I'd wholeheartedly back a Skid Row neighborhood council, but just a couple of them that really, really, I have a high concern about, and I wish I could say more about that, but I won't. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Whoa. Thank you. There's a tremendous amount of understanding from um, Officer Joseph about um, what it's like down there, and hopefully that stimulates some of your thoughts and ideas about how we can all work together. Just like Chris said, we have to take and partner with people that we don't necessarily talk to all the time and make sure that we keep doing what we're doing to move this forward. So at this point, we're gonna have a brief comfort break. We'd like to get back together within about uh, 10 minutes max, and then we'll have our student panel. So um, rejoin us for that. Um, yeah. 